everybody. Welcome to the What Is Money Show. I am thrilled to have you here joining me on my mission to help shine light on the corruption of money. Now, a little bit about this show and how it makes money. We are 100% sponsor based, which means that all the revenues we derive come from sponsorships. But I try to be very selective about the sponsors that I work with, specifically trying to choose those who have values well aligned to the values expressed on this show, like freedom, education, self-sovereignty, etc. So what I'm going to do is a few ad reads right here at the top of the show and then a few ad, ad reads in the middle. And I hope you won't skip them. I hope you'll take the time, listen and see what they have to offer, because again, these are hand selected sponsors. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Swan Private. Swan Private is a concierge financial services firm based in Los Angeles. Now, I've known the Swan team for years, and these guys are laser focused on the Bitcoin mission. They even have a zero tolerance policy for all shitcoining. Recently, their CEO, Corey Clipston, was instrumental in calling out many of these crypto scams right before they collapsed, saving a lot of people a lot of money in the process. Swan Private focuses on guiding high net worth individuals and businesses on all aspects of Bitcoin strategy, including buying, custodying, and market research. This concierge service provides you direct access to a private advisor by text, phone, or email. So go to swanprivate.com slash breedlove today to sign up. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Ledin. Ledin lets you do more with your digital assets. For instance, Ledin offers a B2X loan product that lets you leverage your existing Bitcoin to buy even more Bitcoin. Or you can also get traditional Bitcoin collateralized US dollar loans through Ledin as well. Ledin also offers both Bitcoin and USDC denominated savings accounts, letting you generate yield on your digital assets. Recently, Ledin has launched a Bitcoin mortgage product as well that lets you use Bitcoin to buy a home or finance one that you already own. So go to Ledin.io, that's L-E-D-N.io today to sign up. Christian Langalas, welcome to the What Is Money Show. Hey, Robert. Thanks for having me. Glad to have you here, man. Um, you are popularly known as the Bitcoin sign guy. <laughs> Uh, and by way of quick introduction, you're also the CEO of Terrell Corp, which is named after uh, a flagship Urbit address, and we'll get into Urbit quite a bit today. Um, maybe we could start with just the story of you becoming the infamous Bitcoin sign guy, um, probably converted into millions of memes worldwide, uh, <laughs> one of the most popular in the Bitcoin space, but I would love for you to share how that went down. Sure, man. Uh, happy, happy to uh, to begin at the beginning, I guess. Hmm. The Bitcoin sign was at the Humphrey Hawkins uh, testimony back in 2017. I was in Washington, D.C. for the summer studying uh, at the Cato Institute with George Selgin, who as I was going through college, going down the Bitcoin rabbit hole, I was basically moving from thinking I was going into finance, had a bunch of disillusioning financial industry internships, finding Bitcoin, and then immediately in sort of the most academic and boring way, I thought, well, what can I do in the Bitcoin space? Oh, well, I should begin by studying it and coming up with some theory of it. So maybe you're aware of George, uh, George's work on free banking. Yeah, we had George on the uh, show. Along with Larry White. I mean, yeah, they're just truly, I think, the most relevant monetary economists of the moment. I know that they have, they have some fans in the Bitcoin space. They have some detractors in the Bitcoin space. But I personally thought that they're their theories mapped very closely to how Bitcoin might unfold in the, in the world and how it could be a substrate for a better monetary and banking system. Uh, because banks aren't necessarily evil, you know, they're, they're, they're self-interested 
businesses, but you know they they can provide a lot of good, uh, and they can bring efficiency to to markets, etc. So, with that in mind, I basically set out. Uh, I, I left finance, went to uh, went to DC to study, and then when you're in DC and you're working for economists, sometimes uh, you go cover events just because that's uh you know that's the policy game is you're just those are the people in the backs of every room that you've ever seen on tv they're just people who work for uh think tanks or lobbyists or other policy makers who just take notes so i was just there taking notes uh and but having worked uh for several hedge funds in the past i knew the whole deal with those with those hearings, you know, there's uh, things that policymakers try to get the Fed officials to say, and that's actually the the type of stuff that moves markets when they use one adjective versus another. So they're sort of in a, a vulnerable position. And then I also just knew that while well, the camera's rolling, and I thought it might be funny for my friends back home who you know. At, former employers, they might think, oh, wow, was that our intern? <laughs> so uh, so it was really just a, a small thing that I thought would uh, would just be almost like a personal souvenir. I would just go collect the screenshot. But uh, for better or for worse, it went very viral. And it sort of catapulted my Bitcoin career. Uh, I was able to get some uh, Bitcoin uh, related work at, uh, at a, an early Bitcoin fund after that and just sort of uh, launched me into things. Uh, so and just, just to the, clarify what it was, is you holding up? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, sorry to like gloss over that bit. Uh, I wrote a sign that just said buy Bitcoin uh, as Janet Yellen was being questioned about the transparency of the Federal Reserve. And you know, it, it was sort of jestful, maybe, but uh, <laughs> not intended to be totally Luciferian or something. I wasn't a, there as a protester, basically. I was there as a, as a suit. <laughs> <laughs> well, you said, yeah, buy Bitcoin. I feel like you had at least one line going through the B in Bitcoin. Oh, yeah. Maybe. I know. I did the some would say I did the Bitcoin B wrong and that I, it's actually the symbol for the, for the Thai bot, uh, which, is, which has just a B with a single stroke. Personally, I think that that's a better Bitcoin symbol. Mm. I think that the, the Bitcoin B with the, with the two truncated strokes on the top and bottom is, that would take one, two, three, four, that would take seven pen strokes mm. to, to write so it's it, it should i think that the the b with a single slash through it that's that's at least my version of the shelling point <laughs> especially when you're doing it on a legal pad <laughs> in an interview yeah. with the central bankers you probably just go for the economized pin strokes <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah. and uh yeah. it's just a great shot if you haven't seen it i just encourage people to go google it um because the, the shot i remember at least is Janet Yellen kind of has this look on her face like she's being scrutinized really hard about, as you said, transparency of the Fed. And then the background shot is buy Bitcoin. And I guess the, Im the implicit message that I got from that is like seeing through the bullshit in a way. It's like she's hitting you with some rhetoric and the truth behind what she's saying is just buy Bitcoin. I mean... There were there were certain serendipities of that of that image that were completely beyond my control. Uh, yeah, there was the I think the the best one is the one with the ticker beneath that says you know Yellen. I'm strongly opposed to uh, audit the Fed, basically. Uh, and you know the real I think the real upshot might be that from that day onward. Uh, I don't think Bitcoin ever actually went below that price. It was at the beginning of that 2017 bull run. And yeah, I mean, fortuitous time for me to do it, I suppose, because 
I've never, <laughs> it's never looked like a bad, uh, a bad investment recommendation. <laughs> That's amazing. Wow. <laughs> So cool. That is serendipity right there to catch it at that point in the cycle. Yeah. But, you know, I, it, hey, it, it's, it wasn't, you know, if it wasn't me, it, it might have been someone else, you know. Uh, I I wasn't actually planning to even get that seat behind her. You know, it's mm -hmm. just sort of you file in, you get the seat, you're, you're given. Um, and so, it, you know, it could have been, could have been someone else. I, I look forward to the next Bitcoin sign guy I, <laughs> or Bitcoin sign woman. I give them all encouragement. And you didn't catch any flack for that or? Mm, well, I mean, here, y yes and no. I, I ultimately uh, perhaps departed my internship that summer sooner than expected. But um in in general like i never caught serious flack with the with the government you know they just they kicked me out of the hearing uh several like about 45 minutes after i did it because apparently it was popular online but <laughs> uh, i never i never got sued if that's what you mean totally worth it well <laughs> i applaud you. your pioneering efforts and congrats on becoming a sensational meme <laughs> Thank you. I mean, it's, 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 I hope I, I, I think I'm at risk for, you know, peaking at when I was <laughs> at the very beginning <laughs> of my career. Uh, like, I don't know if I can top that really. So <laughs> I, I guess I'll just be working in the background today. <laughs> Speaking of working in the background, uh, I think Urbit is the, a project you are focused on these days. Um, and it's something that's largely the reason I invited you on, although I love your meme story, as I'm really curious about Urbit. Uh, I first heard about it probably in mid-2018. And the people that were sharing it with me were saying that it's the first thing that had them somewhat as excited as Bitcoin, that yeah. it, it seemed to be somewhat similar in its disruptive potential, I guess, in a nutshell. So maybe we could just start at the really high level, simple question of what is Urbit? Sure. Urbit is a new computer built from scratch, which intends to be maximally simple for the average person to have their own personal server. And if it can succeed in being that, Urbit can be the substrate for a return to a peer-to-peer -peer internet. So that's the most succinct explanation I can give. I, I would add, especially for your audience, that a Bitcoin being a digital technology, it, you know, it has to use the internet to exist. And I fully believe that Bitcoin can uh, thrive on our present internet that's highly centralized and uh, sort of has a top-down network hierarchy however i think it could do there are vulnerabilities there and i think that we could alleviate a lot of those and just generally accelerate if we had a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, a peer-to-peer -peer way of relating online in general so i i see bitcoin and urbit as fundamentally complementary goods there's a lot of things that bitcoin uh, does exceptionally well. It does uniquely well. You know, there's you can't replicate what Bitcoin is and does. Uh, and simultaneously, there are things that Bitcoin cannot do, which you know you look at the long tail of uh, decentralized web projects or uh, you know blockchain 
mania. And you see people trying to grasp at things that they, they want to be able to do, but you know, there's the tension of, oh, well, we can't really have them on Bitcoin. There's this innate conservatism to not, to not adulterate Bitcoin in service of enabling those use cases. So what, you know, what, what are we to do if we want to sort of have, have comparable innovations to, to digital money? Um, you know, is there, is there a system that, uh, you know, doesn't compromise monetary principles, but can, you know, bring about these new, uh, you know, distributed ways of relating to the masses. And so I, I think Urban is fundamentally that, the answer to that question. Interesting. So a new computer built from scratch made simple so every person can have their own personal server, a mm -hmm. return to the peer-to-peer -peer internet. Can we unpack some of those terms? Like or maybe, maybe giving an example for someone that doesn't understand some of this language. Uh, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, I thought maybe hosting your own email server would be one of the killer apps of, of mm -hmm. Urbit perhaps. So maybe you could walk us through that or a better example and what that yeah. means for like an end user. Sure. So yes, yeah, we can actually begin there because I think it's an, an instructive example. Say, you know, you're, you're a tech savvy guy. You hold your own keys to your Bitcoin. Do you run your own email server? I do not. You do not. I, I do hold my own keys. I do not run my own email server. Right. So you, you get all these Bitcoin max ones that thump their chest about online sovereignty. And yet, you know, for a basic messaging service, they, they still default to Gmail. They default to Apple or, or whoever it is, some, some giant to run an email server on their behalf. I mean, ostensibly an email server is far more lightweight than a Bitcoin node. You know, why do, in what world would, you know, someone need to run their own Bitcoin node, but uh, simultaneously not care to run their own email server? And the answer is a world where operating an email server is insanely complex and not just insanely complex, but economically disadvantaged for the way the web works. So there's really just a fundamental uh, problem, which is that the internet is a morass of spam because it's free to send messages to under new IP addresses, and just blast your content. Uh, all over the place. So you get companies like, I'm, this is the simplified version, of course. You get companies like Google who step up and say, hey, you know, we have billions of dollars. We can afford to pay a team of developers uh, to basically filter out the spam, you know, with AI and machine learning and all this high tech stuff just so that when you open your Gmail, you don't, you don't actually see every email that you actually receive in your inbox. You know, go open your spam. You'll, you probably receive a thousand emails a day. Just, you know, saying, you know, give, give away and, uh, you know, <laughs> you know, spam, spam. So, uh, then you get a person who says, oh, well, I want to run my own email server because I don't want Google reading everything I write. And then you realize you don't actually have the, uh, the economic advantage to offer yourself to, to provide a spam filter for yourself, or you can't even, uh, when you send messages, you're just one little server, your, your actual messages get filtered out by Gmail, they don't, they never reach the other person because they themselves 
appear like spam. And so you, you get this internet that is basically just a, we, we default back toward these simulated networks where you have one large data silo where you're actually not networking with anyone else. It's just your row in the database talking to a different row in the database. That's what, that's what basically Gmail is to a large extent. That's what uh, Twitter is. That's what Facebook is. And so the internet only is usable because these large companies have paved it over and made it basically a parking lot. And then in the, in the process, captured all of the uh, captured all of the uh, you know your data and the, are extractive of of the value thereof. So this situation, and just to go into the history of our bit, this present situation uh, was apparent to Curtis. Uh, Curtis Yarvin, the creator of Urbit, uh, relatively early on. So in 2002, Curtis, who had been, uh, he sort of had his digital coming of age in the 80s, in sort of the Usenet era, he actually experienced the peer-to-peer -peer internet firsthand when it was universities, you know, and, you know, collections of collections of little end nodes you know sending sending each other messages it felt like the the true frontier of of computing you know, with the way the internet was evolving you know you get you, we've had about 40 years of 40 years to develop the internet stack as we use it today. And when you have uh, when you have that uh, span of time, there's all these large innovations, all these internet protocols that were built that you know they they work together if you have these large companies to sort of glue them together. But for the average person, it's insanely complex. So Curtis in 2002 basically forecasted that the complexity of the internet stack would mean that average people would uh, soon be basically, uh, they would not have access to the root layers of the internet. And lo and behold, you know, a couple of years later, you know, Facebook appears. And that's at least for me, but being a, somewhere in the interstitial zone between Zoomer and Millennial, you know, that's where basically my internet story began, more or less, MySpace, Facebook. So that, that's all to say he was right. That's, that's what we experience today. And so what did he do about it? So for 10 years, he basically worked on a project or, you know, a, a theory that you could actually take that entire internet stack and synthesize it down to just the, the core essentials. All these parts of so all these bits of software were written at different times with different technological understandings. And so none of them, none of them actually fit that tightly together. So the question he asked is, you know, if you if you saw a computer that came from the future, from you know an an alien from Mars, you know, obviously it would be the best computer ever. Uh, you know, what does it look like? And the, the answer is basically it would just be radically small, simple, and just diamond perfect in terms of how it networks, in terms of how it uh, you know stores information, etc. And that begins in his in his uh, estimate, or that be, that should begin with a mathematical definition of what a computer is. And that was something that he worked on for ten years. Uh, it's 
he created uh, basically this mathematical definition of a computer and called it knock. Uh, and that that definition of a computer would be the, the substrate to build the rest of those networked applications that I mentioned. So 2002 to roughly, I'm, I'm probably getting the year wrong, but let's just call it 2012. He worked on that as just a self-directed PhD project almost. He had some money from the web one, from a web one exit and just said, this is really important work. I'm just gonna set down to it. Uh, you know, meanwhile, of course, you know, internet history is unfolding in the way that he thought it might. Then 2012-ish, uh, he finally has a prototype of this thing. And he thinks, okay, this is ready to actually turn into that computer. Like all he did for basically 10 years, and this might not be exactly correct, but is basically have uh, you know, a list of 12 mathematical functions when in when taken together, you know, are this definition of a computer. Uh, from there, he began, he formed this company called the Talon Corporation and began, you know, hiring people to take this, uh, take that definition and build out different aspects of you know a computer with it so for example a, a networking system a a file system a you know a runtime a, a compiler etc you know a language that you can actually program in called hoon and so all of these primitive you know sort of kernels uh like or elements of the kernel of this computer started to come together those that that then took about call it four years and now we're in uh 2016 and it's the middle of the ico boom and there there's been this one aspect of the computer which uh has largely been a question mark which is what what do you do about a an address space system for this new network? Uh, and so, uh, sorry, this, it's the history is sort of very disjoint here. But he had thought that you basically wanted to uh, to build this computer. You're throwing away everything. That includes DNS, which you know, there's 13 DNS root nodes. They're all owned by universities and basically the military industrial complex. That's who, that's who controls, uh, you know, who speaks on, online. So obviously you need to throw that away. Obviously you need to have a new namespace that's, that basically has what you might call the fair launch, like Satoshi, you know, had a, gave, Bitcoin, a fair launch. So in, in that sense, this fair launch was the people who helped in the early days of this, uh, of this system received blocks of address space. And finally, uh, you know, with the, with the blockchain revolution, I mean, I cringe saying that, but you know, ICO mania, whatever you want to call it. There was finally, I think that the, the idea that this address space should live on a public ledger that is distributed and has robust ownership guarantees. So with that, they explored deploying this address space on you know, one of these systems, they looked at Bitcoin. Ultimately, as as we all as we all know, you know, Bitcoin doesn't really support uh, unique, you know, tokens in in quite the same way as 
uh, something like Ethereum. So it was sort of a, an, a decision made for expedience that, okay, we're, we're going to instantiate this ledger of address space on, on Ether uh, with, with the full acknowledgement that it would be portable long-term if you know, a better alternative came along. So yeah, I guess Bitcoin, I, I wasn't around at the time, but let's just say, you know, Bitcoin colored coins didn't work and, uh, you know, ERC 721s did. So that's why it's there, but not, not set in stone, certainly something that can change later on. So they, they offered uh, a large portion of this address space up to the public with a crowd sale at that point. And that was then another, a second sort of influx of cash to start actually building out the user space of this computer. So you have knock the, the lowest level, like the, the bare metal of this computer. You have the elements of the operating system that I mentioned, you know, the kernel. And now it's 2017 and it's finally time to start building user-facing applications. So uh, that, that was also done under the, under the roof of Talon. Uh, I joined Talon in 2019. They already had a, a little user you know, prototype of this called Landscape which is basically a way to message your friends and uh, you know, blog and just do basic little fun applications on the Urbit network. Uh, and I, I showed up and I thought, you know, this, this system clearly works. It's really uh, crude and primitive feeling. And it's like, we're just resetting the clock on internet development. So, you know, it's, it's buggy, it's not polished, but the bones are so insanely strong that this is something that I think can bring a lot to Bitcoin. And then obviously, you know, looking at it from Urbit's perspective, Urbit is not actually trying to solve money. You know, Bitcoin has done that. And so this computer should have, uh, you know, a a way to pay people that's sort of at the lowest level. There should be an OS primitive for money. You know, plenty of Bitcoiners have said this as, you know, there was, you know, a voice over IP, you know, VoIP, where was MoIP money over IP? Where was the money protocol? And so this is sort of the opportunity to, to give Bitcoin its due as sort of the lowest level monetary protocol that the entire world runs on. And so uh, over the next two years, so from 2019 to 2021, I uh, built a Bitcoin wallet for Urbit with, uh, in conjunction with you know, plenty of people in the Urbit uh, space. I just sort of was the face of the project maybe. And the idea was just give Urbit give an Urbit node the ability to talk to a Bitcoin node and pipe that data in directly. So the way the wallet works is it has uh, a full node integration. You can basically bring your own node to the table or you can rely on uh, a, a node that a friend is running uh, through their Urbit. And then, uh, you know, the you know, the keys are fully, fully, uh, you know, you can store them in a hardware wallet, you can have it be a hot wallet, et cetera. Uh, really, this is just a proof of concept, but, you know, you can use it today, it works. It's one of the default apps when you download Urbit. And so that uh, that's now coming together. Uh, the user space of Urbit in the meantime has been improving dramatically. Uh, and then after I completed that Bitcoin wallet, I started a, 
another urbit company called the Terrell Corporation, which is named after Terrell, which is you know one of the urbit stars we own. And we're we're basically continuing trying to build uh, payment enabled applications on urbit and make this thing relevant for actual online commerce. So we're we're now on that path. There are now many other urbit companies that are are along with us. And generally, I can't speak for everyone, but it is a very cypherpunk ethos on on urbit right now. Uh, you see everyone you know has intentions to you know in you know incorporate Bitcoin, incorporate other cryptocurrencies into these applications and ultimately make them really easy to use. So I guess I've gone sort of on a tangent there, but maybe maybe you can no, <laughs> bring me in and maybe maybe go back on any of the stuff that is was vague or no that's uh, super helpful. Plain. That was super helpful on the kind of history and architecture. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, CrowdHealth. CrowdHealth is a Bitcoin enabled alternative to legacy health insurance. Now let's face it, legacy health insurance is an absolute scam. Nobody can explain this better than the legendary comedian, Chris Rock. Insurance, you got to have some insurance. You got to, there's an insurance. They shouldn't even call it insurance. They should just call it in case shit. <laughs> like, I give a company some money in case shit happens. <laughs> now, if shit don't happen, shouldn't I get my money back? <laughs> <laughs> so with CrowdHealth, instead of just paying premiums that you'll never see again, you can hold part of this pool of savings in dollars and in Bitcoin through CrowdHealth. And when you have a health event, you can draw against this pool of communal savings. So go to joincrowdhealth.com slash breedlove to learn more or sign up. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Wasabi Wallet. Wasabi lets you use Bitcoin privately while still maintaining full control over your money. Specifically, Wasabi Wallet is an open source, non-custodial wallet with privacy built in by default. By using Wasabi, you're effectively putting the private back in private property. Wasabi Wallet is an easy to use privacy wallet that can support any amount of Bitcoin transactions. So go to wasabiwallet.io today to download the state of the art wallet software. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Pacific Bitcoin Conference, brought to you by Swan. Now this is gonna be a two day event in Los Angeles, November 10th and 11th, 2022. And if you haven't been to a Bitcoin conference yet, I highly recommend it as there really is no better way to get integrated into the Bitcoin community. Speakers announced so far include Michael Saylor, Lynn Alden, uh, many others. I'll be speaking as well. Uh, Michael Saylor is even quoted as saying this is going to be the event of the year. So you definitely don't want to miss it. Uh, so go to PacificBitcoin.com and use discount code BREEDLOVE to get your tickets today. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Bitcoin Conference 2023. This is going to be a three day event held May 18th through 20th, 2023 in Miami, Florida. This is going to be the biggest Bitcoin event of the year. And the past two years in Miami have been simply amazing. Speakers already announced for 2023 include Michael Saylor, Alex Gladstein, Corey Clipston, and many others. Last year, we did a 10 million sats giveaway specifically for this event, and we're going to do it again this year. So to get discounted tickets and enter for a chance to win 10 million sats, go to b.tc slash conference slash 2023 and use discount code BREEDLOVE. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Masterworks. Masterworks gives you access to the fine art market at more affordable price points. They do this by offering you fractional shares in their $500 million portfolio of fine art. Now, fine art is an alternative asset class, and historically, it's been a great performer and a really good hedge against inflation. Most investors typically hold anywhere from 2 to 10% of their assets in an asset like fine art. To sign up or learn more, go to masterworks.com and use promo code BREEDLOVE. Now, I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, CASA. 
Casa makes it simple to buy and secure your Bitcoin without wondering whether you're doing it right. Specifically, Casa provides a multi-key custody solution, which is by far the most secure way to custody your Bitcoin. Now, when I talk about Bitcoin being theft-proof money or inviolable private property, a multi-key custody model is exactly what I am talking about. Using multiple keys lets you maintain full control of your Bitcoin while also giving you redundancy in case you lose one of the keys. It's also the best way to secure your Bitcoin for inheritance planning purposes. So go to keys.casa, that's C-A-S-A, -A, today to sign up and use discount code BREEDLOVE. So you mentioned you a star that you own. Maybe you could just speak to the network architecture because I think it's something sure. like galaxies, stars, planets, something like yeah. that. Yeah. Yep. So um, there is there is basically a a multi level address space with Urbit. Uh, it comes from basically the to to have a peer to peer network. You know you need to be able to encounter your peers. And so it's actually easiest to find, to literally locate the IP address of a peer if you, uh, if you have a sort of a federation that can help route you to that person initially. That's called peer discovery. So uh, for that reason, we have this tree-like structure of urban address space where at the top there's 256 galaxies which are basically akin to the root nodes of the urban network then uh, underneath those there's uh, each galaxy has 256 stars which are basically think of them as maybe internet service provider you know that's that's a loose metaphor but they basically uh do a lot of the, the heavy lifting for for peer discovery and then they they also facilitate the sponsorship of planets which are planets basically map one to one to a person on orbit so there's there's 256 galaxies 65,000 stars 4.3 billion planets and that that corresponds to two to the eight, two to the 16, two to the 32. So, you know, why were those numbers chosen? Because they're round and that they actually map fairly neatly onto, you know, how many people out there actually want to go be a root node of this new internet? How many people want to be, uh, you know, in the business of being a service provider? And then roughly how many internet enabled people are there on earth. And, you know, that's actually less than 4 billion. So that's why the network space looks like that. It has, uh, and, and as I mentioned in that crowd sale earlier uh, in 2016, what were sold off were large quantities of those stars. So blocks, a star is basically a block of planets, um, which, you know, you can, you can give out to your friends or your users if you're trying to create some some urbit you know application or something like that so uh that's that's basically how the address space works okay that's cool the so maybe by way of analogy and i don't know if it's useful or not so please correct me but it sounds like this is kind of like an internet with low to no intermediaries sort right. of like bitcoin is money with low to no intermediaries really right none unless you count the miners i suppose right um and that i presume is important for a number of things i, I guess censorship resistance right this is kind of like an internet that can't easily be shut down as compared to current internet and then two, uh, does this relate to data monetization as well? That, you know, today there's that old saying, if the product is free, then you're the product. Right. So we're all, you know, social media users, but we're not actually the customers of social media. We're actually the product because they're selling Correct. our attention to advertisers. Uh, is Urbit instrumental in flipping that paradigm to get us towards uh, something like a self-sovereign 
compute or internet model? Absolutely. So the answer I would say is yes. With the current internet, as you mentioned, you, you sign up, you get a free account, you use a free service and somewhere usually hidden are, you know, is the business model of the company, of the company. So usually that involves uh, having you generate data and then monetizing that data, usually for ads or, or something else uh, like that. Unless of course there's a subscription model and then it's more explicit. With Urbit, the, there is no, there is no sort of concept of a free account on Urbit uh, because you have to acquire an Urbit network address, which is you know a token. So you, they cost ten bucks, but you know it's still you have to explicitly acquire it. And then second, you need to explicitly run it somewhere. So you use that you use that. Uh, that key that you own to basically authenticate all of your packets on the Urbit network. And to, uh, to authenticate uh, your packets, your, um, you, you also need to sort of have the, have the machine that, that, that is sending out those messages, you know, no one's going to give you that machine for free. Uh, there's no, there's no gigantic host in the sky that just benevolently runs these because, you know, computing hardware actually costs something. Uh, you know, you can do this on a laptop, but you know, it still is, it still is your bandwidth. It still is your CPU cycles. It's your, uh, it's your time and effort to keep the computer online. Same same goes for a data center. So uh, many people run Urbits on their own computer at home. Uh, other people opt to acquire a cloud virtual machine somewhere and you know install their Urbit there, and then it's online twenty four seven. I personally. You know the personal node revolution that I think. You know companies like uh, Casa, sort of early on this. You know they tried to get people to have their own Bitcoin node, uh, and you know that that turned out to be an idea that I think was a little ahead of its time. Uh, it's a good idea, but you know most it, it breaks so many people's mental model of the way networking works that people just don't take to it very, very readily. So we'll get to, you know, the home, you know, the, the Urbit running on your little cypherpunk box at home in the future. I mean, there's, there's a company that makes this product now for Urbit, but you know, that that's sort of what we're ultimately going toward. Um, but you know whether you just do it on a on a PC at home or a, a the cloud or one of these little boxes, you have to acquire the hardware. And so, let's just call acquiring your planet a ten dollar cost, and then acquiring the hardware, uh, the networked hardware to run it. That's maybe ten dollars a month. Okay, so you're in for you're in for you know. 20 bucks. And then that's basically the, that's sort of the beginning and the end of economics, the economics of running Urbit. There's no, after that, there's no more, you know, hidden fees. There's no more, uh, you know, ulterior uh, terms and conditions that you signed up for that, you know, later, uh, you know, are used to take advantage of you. Uh, so your Urbit at that point is ready to uh, store data on your behalf, make that data available to other people on the Urbit network. 
and use that data in the context of peer-to-peer -peer applications that you run with other people. So uh, let's just take Urbit, uh, uh, Urbit Groups, which is a popular app. It's If you looked at it, you might think, okay, this kind of looks like Urbit Discord uh, or something similar. So you want to host a chat room with your friends. You know, you can actually host that on your Urbit. When your friends send you messages, uh, they go directly to you. You send a message, it goes directly to your friend. There's no, there's no other organ in between that tries, uh, that even has access to the, the flow of that information. It's it's end-to-end -end encrypted and fully peer-to-peer. And in the future, uh, as we sort of build out nicer interfaces, you know, it will be like that for file sharing. It will be that way for collaborating on documents, for sharing podcasts or videos or publishing any type of content to the web. Um, beyond that, you know, it can even be, it's, it's a web server. So you can actually serve websites from your Urbit. This is something that my company has been probably most focused on, which is that you can just have, you, you have this server, now you can use it like a server. You don't just have to stay in the virtual Urbit world. You know, you can, with literally two clicks, you can spin up a website and have it available to anyone online. They don't have to have Urbit. Uh, but your Urbit can give them can give them the information that they're requesting. So I think that right now this is sort of this jolly situation. It's like, oh, cool, you know, I'm do I'm doing all my messaging on on Urbit. You know, I can I can delete my account finally. You know, like once the apps are there, like awesome. I can I can get off uh, I can get off these services. I can move towards one that's private, where I don't leak data, where I control what types of interfaces I use. Most everything is open source. Uh, you know, I no longer have to use a one size fits all uh, application where, you know, everyone loves to complain like, oh, they changed the interface again. And you have no rebuttal against that. On Urbit, you know, run what run whatever software you want. You want to stay on, you know, the old version of something as long as it's uh, it, for, you know, you, you can basically keep doing stuff like that. You can basically have an inner, uh, a computer that feels more like a house where you can rearrange the furniture versus, you know, just living in a hotel where everything's nailed down. So that's, that's sort of the, the future vision of Urbit that we're just sort of, we're, I don't even think we really comprehend what that, what that means for, I, I don't wanna to sound too grandiose, but you know, what that means for society to have a, a network that does not have the, this sort of the shifting sands of some large organizations, you know, cybernetics uh, underneath. You know, it's just, very cut and dry. You own this thing. You can do whatever you want with it. You can compute with friends. You can uh, you can run whatever applications you want. And for the for the first time, maybe not ever, but you know, for the first time at scale, every person who's using Urbit has a digital agent that can go do things on the internet on their behalf in a fully trusted way. You know, up until now, you know, you've always had to basically rely on some other service to, you know, effectuate your, your actions online. You want to send a message, you want to post a tweet, you want to uh, send a payment, you know, you got to ask permission, you have to do it on someone else's terms, and you have to trust that they'll, uh, you know, not take advantage of you for trying to do that. Uh, with Urbit, it's completely, I, I could say it's 
it's post-political. It's, it's no longer subject to some other process. It's just something that you have the permissionless right to do. So I think that that's- I like that. I like that a lot, that's, actually. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's, it's especially, uh, I mean, the analogy you could make is that Bitcoin is permissionless money, Urbit is just permissionless compute. Um, and I guess this is the point of the conversation where I can say, I'm a Bitcoin maximalist. I, uh, I know that the Urbit um, sort of network, uh, like address space, sometimes bristles Bitcoiners for, for good reason. Um, cause it's like this, this token, but basically I believe that, uh, having, uh, there's a lot of Bitcoiners, uh, who are like rah, rah, Bitcoin maximalism, uh, monetary sovereignty. And then without any perception of irony, you know, they, they blast about that on Twitter. And it's like, man, you're, you're getting, you've, uh, you've obtained sovereignty in one aspect of your digital life, which is a huge one. It's, it's the way things are funded, but you're still, you're still existing in this fun house of, you know, software written by other people. And we, we now see Bitcoiners, it's, it's starting to dawn on Bitcoiners, I think, when you see applications like Sphinx chat or impervious AI, you, you're, there's, some, there's some Bitcoiners who think, okay, well, you know, can we use Bitcoin to uh, start to improve our, you know, the guarantees of our internet usage? Uh, and to that, I would say, you know, you actually don't need Bitcoin to do that, you just, what you're actually after is you just want a general purpose computer. And you can't use your, you can't use your, uh, you know, your Mac, your MacBook, because your MacBook was built in the context of client server paradigm computing, where all you're doing is downloading stuff for the most part, and then uploading several messages, but never actually, never actually being the always online server. So I think that more and more people will, uh, people will realize that to, to complement the sovereignty that they've obtained with Bitcoin, holding their keys, running a node, that they also desire or, or would be desirous of a, a personal server. And so that's really, that's really the, the thrust of, I think, bringing Bitcoiners onto Urbit for me. Yeah, it, it makes a lot of sense that, to use your term, Bitcoin is like post-political money, right? It's, that's why I don't even like the term monetary policy as it relates to Bitcoin, because it's not anything that's really enforced. It's sort of just opted into. Yeah. Rather than shelling point consensus. Yes. Rather than traditional fiat monetary policies that exist by enforcement, it would stand to reason, I guess, at, at a minimum, that we would also prefer to have a post political internet um, or, or computing system, I guess, more generally. What, okay, I guess a retort that some Bitcoin maximalists may make and they, as they make about most projects is that if you can't build it on Bitcoin, then you don't need to build it, something like that. But you said earlier that you see Urbit and Bitcoin as complementary systems. Mm -hmm. So how do you, could you just elaborate on that? How are they complementary sure. and what is it, I guess, about Urbit that, that's doing things Bitcoin cannot do or cannot be done on Bitcoin? Right. Well, I mean, as we all would acknowledge, you know, Bitcoin is Bitcoin is not even a Turing complete computer. And I, I say for good reason, uh, there are some people who I think have not fallen into the trap, but of thinking that someday, somehow Bitcoin will replicate the entire 
internet on chain somehow through some system, but when, and no, no disrespect to the people who are working on it, because I do think it's, it's an interesting question, but uh, it starts to look more and more like a Rube Goldberg machine to try to invent, you know, just peer to peer messaging on Bitcoin, uh, you know, say via the lightning network or something. I think that there are some interesting concepts there, like, you know, internet postage or something like that uh, for paying for routing fees. But, uh, you know, you need to, to, to run applications, you just need compute, you need a computer and there's nothing, there's nothing evil about that. Um, there's, there's also just the great irony that all these people, they're still, they're still using services that basically treat them as a row in a database. They're on Twitter. They, they don't run their own email server. You know, they're, so they're on someone else's email server. They make, they make websites, uh, to distribute content, which is cool, but it's like, well, you don't own that website fundamentally. I mean, that domain name can be expropriated from you. Uh, or, you know, if you fail to get the right protection uh, for it, you can, uh, you can just get DOSed and basically wiped off the internet. So you, like Cloudflare is the, you know, the official gatekeeper of, of the web. Uh, for that reason, it's, it's like a completely extra ju judicial check on someone's ability to talk. So what if instead of all that, you had basically a, a, a network identity that you owned uh, that wasn't subject to some external process, but that you, you basically had confidence in and could use as sort of the like a, a way to bootstrap a digital life. And you could take that, uh, you know, when, when everyone is using such an ID, uh, you know, you can have, uh, you can have superior guarantees for, for what it means to just be online. So uh, the main thing here is like, you can, because these IDs are costly, you don't have people spamming you uh, because it's really expensive to do that because you can just easily bl blacklist someone, uh, blacklist an ID, subscribe to someone else's curated blacklist of IDs and uh, basically just continue. Uh, it permits you to basically only access sort of high quality internet traffic basically so so that's really the the point is that urbit has sort of the the unique technical uh technical advantage of basically enabling this peer-to-peer -peer internet uh without without having to go through sort of odd odd gyrations like like we're seeing some experiments with now um, by the way, uh, Tim May, you know, cypherpunk, like maybe the father of cypherpunk, uh, ideology or just theory, you know, he had this great email, um, this great email, uh, signature. Are you, are you familiar with it? This is the guy that wrote the declaration of independence for the internet. I don't know if it's uh, to that. Tim May Tim May wrote the uh, cypherpunk manifesto, I think. Hold on. Wait, now I'm let me just let me find this. Uh, let's see. Crypto. No, it was the uh, the cyphernomicon, which which included uh, you know, his earlier writing on the crypto anarchist manifesto. But anyway, uh, he had this email signature 
which basically was a description, not a prescription, of the evolution of cypherpunk uh, technology. And uh, there's at the very end of his email, uh, let's see, let me find it here. My email signature, it concluded, um, where is it? Here it is. Okay, crypto anarchy. Uh, encryption, digital money, so Bitcoin, anonymous networks, digital pseudonyms, zero knowledge, reputations, information markets, black markets, collapse of governments. So that little litany uh, is basically the, you know, it's a, it's a, postulate about how just as a society, we can use computers to just evolve our ways of relating in the direction of you know, freedom, liberty, you know, just to put my libertarian hat on. Uh, so the, uh, the concept of Bitcoin, you know, is actually really only the second item on that list, if you think of them in sort of stacking in order of uh, of like each each one is a primitive to to subsequent ones. So we have encryption, we have the cypherpunks. They invent, you know, we get Satoshi, or we get all these early attempts to create digital money. Then we finally get Satoshi. It works, and so now we're trying to build these extremely robust networks that can actually leverage digital money and, and use it in a fully you know, post-political fashion. So with that, you, you basically can obtain many items on that list using Urbit. So Urbit is pseudo-anonymous by default. Uh, you can use those because those pseudonyms are uh, you know, bearer digital assets, you can use them to accumulate a uh, digital reputation around certain uh, public keys. And you, if you're running, you know, peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, you know, marketplace applications, you can start to get this completely, th this market process that is completely beyond, uh, beyond the political. And so, that's really where I see Urbit sort of fitting into the the trajectory of the internet and one that I think most Bitcoiners would would desire. That's really cool. I'd actually I've never heard of that email signature, but um, fantastic sequence and yeah. quite prescient because he probably wrote that back in the '90s or something like that. I presume. Uh, I early, think so. Um, early two thousands, maybe. Uh, yeah, he like he he stopped writing in. He stopped writing, I believe, in two thousand and three. But like, yeah, the the majority of his, the majority of his work was in the nineties. Yeah. So, that's incredible. Then we might be just at the beginning of a real transformational you know, the, the coming, the emergence of a new age, right? The transition from industrial to digital age, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. I know you said you didn't want to get too grandiose looking into the future, but if I asked you to speculate on your deep vision for the urbanized future, is it summed up in that little uh, litany that he shared or, or how would you, how would you elaborate? So, I mean, the, it, the end of his list is collapse of governments, which, you know, that's, that's speaking in the negative, speaking in the positive, that means the rise of new uh, ways of organizing as, as uh, individuals or societies. So I think that more, more and more we're seeing uh, 
we're seeing the the top, the, you know, the the heaviness of states as you know these gigantic one size fits all jurisdictional uh, bodies that call it, you know, crypto people are sort of leaking out of at the margins. They they go off in search of, uh, you know, jurisdictions that are. Uh, favorable to to Bitcoin to whatever their whatever their project is, and almost universally, it's sort of moving in the direction of I don't know, less fair economics, free markets, uh, lack or the you know the absence of control over over uh, over markets. So this is sort of the this drive toward obtaining, you know, securitizing these, uh, I don't even want to call them rights, but these uncontested abilities in cyberspace, I think maybe has a historical parallel in say the search for religious freedom. You know, I think that fundamentally, uh, you know, if you want to talk about the American project, I see Bitcoin and Urbit as actually uh, furthering the the American project that began with the Puritans. And you know, are we all sort of like the the digital uh, the digital Puritan like now on our Mayflower going into cyberspace? You know, possibly. Uh, I know that there are, we're increasingly seeing a uh, little, uh, call it colonies of, of Bitcoin folk, of other blockchain type folk, of even urbit folk who go to regions of the world, you know, El Salvador, uh, Ukraine prior to the, uh, to the troubles, <laughs> uh, or you know, wh whatever, whatever little spot it is, that to me looks like the, you know, the Plymouth of the, of the modern day, uh, where they're, they're off trying to go do their own thing, you know, get together with their, with their people and, you know, lay down some, lay down some, some new communicate, uh, community that's, that's largely enabled through, you know, this, you know, through Bitcoin and and other similar technologies. So I, I don't know if uh, you know there there are popularized versions of this idea. Maybe you know the network state is one way of talking about it. Uh, you know, pirate utopia uh, or or something else. But it does seem like a relatively rich field at this point. You know, there's seasteading people and there's people who want to go, you know, just build these random little worlds that I think ultimately have the, uh, they don't even, the difference here is that they don't even need to become these, um, they don't need to even become the default paradigm to be successful. They can be successful unto themselves and uh, will to, to move backward in history, you know, that it's more comparable to the to the old model of city states where you have a patchwork of different polities that have their own, they have their own rules, they have their own norms. Uh, Urban is actually not even uh, about you know, rejecting norms per se. It's just about having them be uh, be flexible and you know scalable to you know the members that they apply to. If that makes sense. Yeah, that's a that's a that's an original kind of analogy you gave there with uh, the Puritans and. I like that terminology too. Un, I don't think this is exactly how you said it, but the idea of uncontestable capacities for action in cyberspace 
it's not really a right. It's just there's a there's ways of being online that no one can really do anything about in this Bitcoinized, urbanized future. Right. So I give all I give in that in that sense I give all 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 credit for my thinking on that to Cody Wilson who showed us that with a 3D printed gun, you know, you can use technologies in ways that completely escape, uh, you know, it, escape past controls, like gun control is yeah. basically dead because anyone can make a gun now at home with a 3D printer. Right, yeah, it's in the digital age, money became speech, guns become speech. And, you know, if you've got rails for unstoppable speech, then all of a sudden, it's like, you know, to your point, this extension of the American project, it's we're kind of, we're carrying the spirit of the US Constitution forward into better, uh, I guess, less stoppable vehicles or less corruptible vehicles, something like that. Um, and so maybe the, the common thread there is like, it's just, we're, it's just making coercion less profitable, right? Like Bitcoin's really hard to steal. So that helps disincentivize coercion. Sounds like Urbit, you can't, it's really hard to coerce people into to doing things with their data. If they just own it. They can, they're really mobile. They just have a lot of autonomy, a lot of sovereignty mm -hmm. at the individual right. level. Yes. Um, so that's super powerful stuff. Um, man, this, Christian, this is a great conversation. I, I really appreciate you opening my eyes and, and my audience's eyes to the importance of this project. Um, well, thank you. Um, naturally, you know, just to digress slightly, there will be, uh, as with Bitcoin, you know, there will be compromises made in the name of scaling to get there. So, you know, how many how many people hold their keys versus hold them on an exchange? So the urban analogy to that right now is we're seeing sort of the dawn of urban hosting. So you go and you make a, an agreement with a company that basically says, we'll, we'll hold your urban online for you. And, you know, you, you're free to withdraw it. You know, you can take, you can go port your ID, your identity. You can port your ur uh, technically speaking, your urbit is just one file. It's like one one event log for the entire life of the computer. And so that file is also just very portable. Uh, so you take your you take your key and you take your event log and you plug them into any computer on earth, like your urbit will just pop up. Um, but naturally, you know, people uh, you know people are aren't people are slowly acclimating to the idea that they need to run these things themselves to get the full benefit. But there is sort of the transitional state where someone else is sort of helping you do that. You know, you get help from Cash App or Coinbase or whoever. So that's sort of where we're at with Urbit right now is sort of scaling these, these onboarding systems. You know, they get people in the door and then uh, from there, you know, they have the opportunity later on to sort of fully, fully take, take back their, uh, take back their, um, their entire orbit if they, if they so desire. I, I think that if I've, if I've learned one thing throughout, uh, like through my travels with Bitcoin, and Urbit, it's that actually, you know, a lot of people feel they, they don't even desire absolute control, literal control over the thing. They just want, they just want the good guarantee that it's not going to fall out from underneath them. So uh, are you aware of the project Fetty, uh, like Fetty Mint yeah. with uh, Justin Moon and, yeah. and those guys? So I think that that's pretty instructive to me for showing us the way that people actually, you know, they're willing to actually cede strict control to say a trusted peer, like a friend who 
can run their Bitcoin node or can, you know, run some lightning channels on their behalf. And you, you can have, uh, you know, trust can be transformed through those, through those systems. Uh, I'm, I believe that something like that, you know, can basically exist for Urbit. Um, but the point is that ultimately you can, you can be more fine tuned with what kind of, uh, trust assumptions you want to make with your life, you know, whereas 10 years ago, you know, you have no alternative to the bank, you know, the bank is the bank. It's one size fits all for the entire society. And, uh, you know, when the system breaks down, you know, you're there, you're there, you know, crowded at the doors of the bank trying to get your money back. Um, same thing, same thing with Herbert. Yeah, it's a, it's a great point that the scaling is complicated and requires navigation of trade-offs. So that there can be some elements of centralization along that path, as we see in Bitcoin with custodians mostly. Mm -hmm. um, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, well, this was, again, really great conversation. Uh, it, could you let my audience know where they can find out more about you or your work? Sure, sure. Uh, so uh, my company's website is Terrell.io, which is actually hosted on our Urbit, believe it or not. <laughs> so, uh, so that's funny. Um, that is probably where, uh, but honestly, that's not even the most relevant thing. The, if you want to just know more about Urbit itself, just go to urbit.org. Uh, which is run by the Urbit Foundation. Um, then uh, there's some instructions on how to get on Urbit. There, uh, you know, you can you can go buy a planet uh, at their numerous vendors, and uh, maybe get hosting as well if you want it. And then uh, come find me on the Urbit network. Uh, my name is uh, Pindet Timut. That's my Urbit ID. And you can join the Urbit Coiners group that I have running on Urbit. It's sort of the where we strategize about uh, Bitcoin development on Urbit. We have a lot of stuff cooking right now. We're getting pretty close to uh, adding Lightning to our wallet uh, and then doing all sorts of uh, sort of cutting edge Bitcoin stuff. Like we'll probably have one of the first uh, implementations of Taro, for example, like Urbit is, Urbit is extremely powerful uh, in terms of what it can do for Bitcoin. Um, so I'm, I'm very excited for all that. I would invite uh, anyone who's looking for a, an interesting development uh, challenge uh, in that regard to uh, learn Hoon, Urbit's uh, programming language and come come help us build tools for Bitcoin uh, so that we can uh, get the hell off those servers. And <laughs> so we can hurry up and collapse those governments. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, <laughs> Man, uh, well, uh, thank you for having me. I, I appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to, to shed some light on, I think maybe in, not even it's not even misunderstood because urban is hard to under it is hard to explain because most people don't interrogate why they like what a computer is in the first place but even just uh i think urban is still just very obscure generally mm -hmm. it's sort of uh just like the bitcoin thing you know you have you had to hear the word bitcoin you know three or four times before you actually decided to apply any mm -hmm. mental effort to it, Urbit is probably the same way. So, uh, you know, Urbit, Urbit, Urbit. You've heard it <laughs> <now>. <laughs> come, come yeah. hang out. Happy to help amplify the message. Really enjoyed the conversation. Um, and I will drop a lot of that information in the show notes that you just listed. And we'll do really? this again sometime. Fantastic. Thank you, Robert. Appreciate Thanks. it.